My name is David Malone. I have the privilege of working at the UN University in uh, Tokyo, which is its headquarters. And uh, as often we do, we have a wonderful guest with us today, uh, Shui Lan, uh, who is the dean of the School of Public Policy and Management of Tsinghua University in Beijing. Most of you will know it's one of the great universities of China. And it's also one of the great universities of the world. And I think it was created with the ambition that it would be one of the great <laughs> universities of <laughs> the world uh, in the early 20th century. A fabulous campus full of wonderful people, uh, which I had the pleasure of visiting uh, last year. And Dr. Shui and I have known each other for many years now because he used to be on the board, the excellent board of an institution I worked in. So our acquaintanceship goes back a long way. Our topic tonight in Tokyo in a public engagement uh, will be um, priorities and challenges in public administration in China. Now, uh, all of those are in some ways coded words in the sense that they cover so much territory. Yeah. We can touch on only a few dimensions in this brief chat, uh, which brings to our website some of the things we'll be touching on this evening, and of course will be taken in different directions by members of the audience who may have this interest or that. Um, but Alan, I had wanted to ask you at first, you were uh, uh, educated in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, you got a PhD from Carnegie Mellon, a mm -hmm. great American university in a reviving city uh, Pittsburgh. of Pittsburgh, <laughs> yeah. which I love actually. Great industrial architecture and great architecture in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you stayed on in the United States, but you were drawn back to your country, yeah. I remember you telling me. And could you tell me just briefly and our mm -hmm. audience, mm -hmm. what drew you back to China at a time when you were so successful in the United yeah. States? Uh, I think actually the, uh, I went back in 1996, and partly because that they actually uh, what I saw uh, at the time was that um, China was really, I think, uh, the, the, you know, sort of really the, a very critical time of its uh, reform, economic reform. Mm -hmm. And so the government is playing a very critical role but I think uh, what to my, actually to my surprise, uh, there was not a, a, a sort of a formal educational program in public administration. There were MP, MBAs, Master of Business and, uh, Administration, but there was no MPA program at all in China. So that, that's sort of, you know, a, quite a surprise. Uh, so I, I see there's a huge sort of, you know, gap that can be filled. Uh, with sort of, sort of my sort of training. So that's a, a major reason that I felt that I, I could be very useful in, uh, in starting that process. Mm. Yeah. Well, I also think in many ways your family benefited, in particular your mm -hmm. son, mm -hmm. from going back to <laughs> China, yeah. getting to know his own country, and yeah. he's now in the United States. That's, right, yeah. that's true to the globalized nature yeah. of uh, business in the world today, be it public uh, policy or be it uh, um, the private sector. Yeah. Uh, coming to priorities and challenges yeah. in China, mm -hmm. the paradox seems to be mm -hmm. that as countries grow more successful, and there's no doubt that China is the great success story mm -hmm. of the second half of the 20th century, particularly from 1980 onwards, mm -hmm. Uh, actually, things just get more complicated, particularly exactly. for public policy and yeah. administration. And yeah. how is China dealing with huge uh, demands and a much more demanding public? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that in a way, um, uh, China's uh, economic transition, economic uh, reform, uh, has been a quite uh, successful. Started in late 1970s onto the, the, the 2000s. And the average economic growth rate is about 10%, and uh, the people's life have changed dramatically. But as China moved into this, sort of in particular, I think after 2000s, uh, mid-2000s, it's clear uh, that the, the old model, 
it's no longer um, it's no not uh, no longer sustainable. Uh, the, there's a need for China to make the transition, but at the same time, it was so difficult to make the transition. So in a way, I think the new uh, you know the new leadership, when they came to office, so in a way they started more of a second major reform. Uh, what I call that reform is a more of a public administration reform. Uh, because I think the first one, if you call it the economic reform, I, I think the second one is really a, re a reform of the public sector. And the first one deals with the relationship between the government and the, the market. China, as you know, that has the legacy of the central planning economy. So basically, during the first uh, you know, 30 plus years of the reform, was basically so the how to let the, 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 the market to gradually sort of taking its place. The, the government is gradually sort of uh, relinquishing its sort of control of the market. But again, that's more done a you know, very sort of feeding the stone, um, you know, crossing the river by feeding the stone, so very haphazard way. But now it's to the degree that there's a need, a systematic reform of how to formalize you know, the relationship, uh, what really needs to be leave to the market, mm. what needs to be leave to the, to, the, to the government. So that's a very challenging task. So on the one hand, the government needs to really to, uh, 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 you know, on the economic uh, uh, you know, regulation, there's a need to, uh, for government to lose, to deregulate. On the other hand, on the more of a so-called this social regulation on the safety and so on, there's a need to tighten it. That's a challenge, very difficult to understand, to implement. And also China is doing all of this at breakneck speed. When I think of in mm -hmm. terms of scale, mm -hmm. its uh, obvious comparator, which would be the United States, mm -hmm. it developed really over a period of about 100 years. Uh, in what China has done in about 30 years. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. means all of mm -hmm. this meshes together yeah. huge pressures yeah. uh, on the government, yeah. on administration, yeah. uh, with a public that is so rapidly changing, changing yeah. in its expectations. Yeah. It must be uh, quite difficult for the government to assess mm -hmm. what is most desired by the public and most important to the public. Yeah. I think that's another dimension that indeed is adding uh, to the complexity of the uh, you know government re response in, in in the daily sort of administration. As you said, I think first of all, I think as people's uh, you know life have uh, improved and their expectation is also getting higher, and also plus the social media has become such a powerful tool for people to you know to communicate and to express themselves. So I think the, uh, the expectation is very high and also so very different views on various policy issues. Uh, for example, in the uh, health sector, uh, there is a tremendous pressure for the government to you know, pro provide this as a public good. But at the same time, the capacity is just not there. The investment is huge. So how do you balance that in terms of providing a quality health, but at the same time, that's sort of, you know, it's uh, uh, cost uh, effective. Uh, so that's sort of the, the kind of a, you know, challenge almost in every sector. Uh, that also, I think, adds pressure to the policy implementation uh, uh, process. Mm. Uh, often, I think that people think of the China as a, a, a place where policy can be made uh, quickly. Uh, n not so easily uh, in, 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 in today's uh, China. Uh, and the implementation is even more challenging. So those are the uh, challenges that people have to I think in, in many uh, very economically advanced states, mm -hmm. uh, all governments face similar challenges. Uh, all governments have expenditures under certain headings, mm -hmm. um, but the two largest ones, as one mm -hmm. becomes more successful, and China is rapidly mm -hmm. uh, joining the very successful club, mm -hmm. is health and education. They are yeah. two huge pots. We yeah. think of them as social spending, yeah. and they are, 
but um, they represent massive public investment. Yeah. Uh, and the, the more demanding the public is, mm -hmm. the better the services have yeah. to be. And I wanted to ask you about each of them. Yeah. You mentioned health just yeah. now, yeah. so perhaps we could start with health, yeah. but then come back to education, education sure. because there's no doubt that there's mm -hmm. a huge hunger in yeah. China for yeah. quality education. Yeah. Yeah. I think on the, on the health sector, I think China basically, uh, in a way, I think it, during the central planning uh, state, China had a sort of a, a, a pretty good quality of um, general public health. The medical service is, uh, is limited, but the general public health is, uh, 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 was very well provided. And so in the economic reform period of time, uh, China began to adopt some market-based approach in uh, reducing the uh, funding for, uh, medical, for public hospitals and the pushing them to generate revenues uh, through collecting fees. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, system was distorted uh, in, in many ways. So by the time of um, um, uh, 2005, 2006, there were wide complaints about um, uh, it's so difficult to, to see a doctor. It's so expensive to see a doctor. So in 2007, the, uh, uh, you know, China began to have a huge debate about the uh, health system reform. And in 2009, a reform plan uh, came out, and the basic, uh, the basic idea is to provide a universal coverage for, uh, for the general population. So that, that was indeed achieved in, in, uh, uh, in about three years. And so now over 90% of the Chinese population are under uh, the, the health, uh, some sort of a health plan, health insurance plan. Uh, but of course, that that uh, the coverage is somewhat sort of you know relatively shallow. Mm. But of course, you know when once you have that framework, then of course you can by adding more spending, and then you can coverage you know cover more. The problem though is you know on the on the service side, on the provision side, uh, the reform is still limited. So there's still a very difficult to see a good doctor, to see a you know to uh, see a, 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 you know, to go to a, a, a hospital. So I think that that's the challenge now uh, people are still, you know, fighting with. So China is now probably need to have the second phase of the reform, how to reform the, the, the provision side so that it actually can meet the demand. Well, even the richest countries in the world struggle with how much the, yeah. the public sector should yeah. support public health. Yeah. And yeah. as you were saying yeah. earlier, yeah. Uh, how much individuals need to contribute themselves. On yeah. education, mm -hmm. it seems to me that ambition all over the world mm -hmm. has been rising mm -hmm. for the quality of education. Yeah. Uh, people have fewer children in mm -hmm. many countries. They want to invest more in the children they have. Mm -hmm. And they want to make sure that the education they get mm -hmm. is high quality education. Yeah. Not so easy to deliver high quality education in a country yeah. on the scale yeah. of China. Yeah. yeah, I think in China, I think that, uh, first of all, I think for the uh, primary education, I think, uh, uh, first of all, I think in general, I think that that has been, uh, you know, has improved dramatically uh, over the last uh, 30 plus years of the reform, uh, but still, uh, there are challenges in the remote areas, in the rural areas, because I think that uh, increasingly, I think it's um, particularly when you have migrant uh, uh, laborers come into the cities, uh, sometimes they leave their children at home, and how to provide good quality of education for that, uh, for those children, that's one challenge. The other challenge is how to provide good education for those who brought their children to the cities. Because I think the migrant labor, the Chinese uh, public, uh, you know, education is provided to people who, who, who live in the city with the so-called the registrations uh, of the city registration. The migrant laborers, uh, you know, their children, they don't have the registration. Uh, it, so they, there's a challenge to the local government. If they can provide good quality education to those children, there'll be more migrant labor coming to the city just for the sake of getting that education. So there's no way to can meet that huge demand. 
But if they don't provide a quality ed education, then those kids would suffer in the future. So that's the dilemma on the primary education side. On the higher education side, in general, again, I think China has expanded its higher education dramatically mm. over the last 30 plus years. I think, um, in, the, I think in, in about um, uh, 1998, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the so-called the, the growth enrollment rate is a close about uh, eight or nine percent of the, you know, so the age cohort. Now it's 40 percent uh, last year, so it's 40 percent. So there's a quite, uh, uh, you know, dramatic growth. But at the same time, it, du during this dramatic expansion period, uh, there were many uh, uh, newly, uh, you know, sort of created, uh, you know, university. Uh, the quality of, of, of their education is, is, is varied. So I think how to maintain the quality is a challenge. Uh, of course, at the same time, there are also many uh, universities like Tsinghua and so on that aspire to become you know, uh, world-class universities or also sort of working hard to become uh, research-based universities. Again, uh, how they can become sort of a research university, but at the same time that also uh, caters to the demand of the domestic demand. That, that balance is also a challenge. Well, for those of you who are watching, who are interested in public policy and who are students, you should know that the School of Public Policy and Management at Tsinghua offers an extraordinary master's course for international students. Uh, I met with them last year when I was in Beijing and found it extremely exciting. Now, I know it's very competitive, but somebody has to win the seat. So, yeah, so I'd encourage any of you who are thinking of studying public policy, uh, which uh, uh, by and large we teach only in our institute in Maastricht, of which uh, Dr. Shui has been one of the board members, um, to consider very strongly the program at Tsinghua, the mix of people, uh, the students themselves, the faculty, faculty, tremendously exciting. And as you can see, the dean, very impressive. Lan, thank you very much for being with us online. Thank you.